Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us in this installment of the uh, DNA Learning Center's Meet a Scientist Seminar Series. Uh, we are very excited to have Dr. Joel Stern here with us today. He is a professor of neurology, urology, molecular medicine, and science education at the Donald and Barbara Zucker School of Medicine uh, with North, uh, Hofstra Northwell. Um, so quite a lot of roles, very impressed background. So we're very happy to have him here to tell us about his journey um, to get here uh, to where he is today at Hofstra Northwell. Um, and before I turn things over to him, I just want to make a couple quick announcements about our DNALC uh, programming that we have coming up this spring and summer. So I'm just going to share my screen. Um, so we've got quite a few uh, public events coming up. Um, we have our Saturday DNA sessions, which are open to the public um, on Saturdays, obviously. Um, and there's just a nice change of pace for anybody to come in for different age groups um, at all three of our locations, our Dolan DNA Learning Center out on Long Island, our Brooklyn location, and the Sleepy Hollow location with our Regeneron DNA Learning Center. So we've got our uh, new spring Saturday DNA sessions up and posted, and those are ready to go. And we also have our science summer camps schedule uh, posted, and registration for this summer is now open at all three of our locations, both Long Island, Brooklyn, and Sleepy Hollow. Um, you can take a look at our summer camp website. Um, take a look at all of the different camps that we offer, all for different age groups, um, all week-long summer camps. <clears throat> so if you are interested in attending any of those summer camps, that, that registration is now open. Uh, those will start the last week of June. So those are all the announcements and plugs that I wanted to share before I turn it over to Dr. Stern. So uh, Dr. Stern, uh, take it away. Okay. Can you see my screen? Okay. Okay. So, so good afternoon. My name is Joel Stern, and and it's a it's a pleasure to talk to you about my career, balancing both teaching and research. Um, my first exposure to research was at as an ERP at Cold Spring Harbor Labs. The ERP stands for Undergraduate Research Program, and I work with Dr. Alcino Silver studying the learning deficits associated with neurofibromatosis type one. Um, and this was during uh, my time as an undergraduate at Columbia University. And I was very excited about research and I wanted to explore applied research. So I wanted to help people with different uh, conditions. And after uh, I graduated from Columbia with a focus in biology, I had the opportunity to come uh, uh, work as an instructor at the DNA Learning Center. And now I guess it's called the Dolan DNA Learning Center. And this was a great experience and I wanted to explore teaching, but also train the next generation of scientists. And it was a wonderful opportunity that sort of shaped my future plans and goals. And um, I found out that Jack Strominger was uh, a researcher that was studying autoimmune diseases at Harvard. And I was very motivated to help patients. So I wanted to pursue a PhD in his lab. And after I got into his lab, I focused on creating immune modulators to treat the murine model of, of a specific autoimmune disease that we're going to talk about later today, and that's called multiple sclerosis. Um, but before I left, after I left this lab, I became a Dean Scholar at the Harvard Dental and Medical School, and I had the honor of teaching um, immunology and autoimmunity to dental and medical students, um, and I received several Derek Bach Harvard Teaching Awards for my work there but I always wanted to explore clinical medicine. And I had an opportunity after, after this work to go to Yale School of Medicine, and I became uh, a Yale uh, a neurology fellow um, with, with the help of an NIH T32 grant. And um, my main focus was to study the immune system in patients with multiple sclerosis. So it was a very clinically oriented uh, research project. And, um, and this was sort of, it was translationally based. Um, and after this experience, I was recruited to go to uh, Zucker School of Medicine as an assistant professor, where I continued this research 
this translational research, and, um, and now I'm currently a professor in several departments where I teach uh, medical students, but I also teach um, allergy and immunology fellows, uh, both basic and clinical immunology. So it's been a very nice journey. My career could be segmented into two parts. Uh, it's the teaching um, and the other part is the research. But I just wanted to talk to you a little bit about the teaching. So what are the roles of a medical educator? So it, can, it consists of many different things. So I have to be a team member. You have to be a content expert, which is extremely important, as well as using technology. Uh, you're, you're functioning almost as a professional coach where you have to uh, create a comfortable learning environment for your students. And you have to be a lifelong learner. So you're always learning new material. Um, so you have to be up to date on all of the literature and the current findings in, in, in your particular field of expertise. So when I started out, I, I set up an office of medical student research. And this was to help students find research mentors and provide research guidance at all stages of their career while at medical school. So this covered all four years of their training. Then um, I ran lots of interactive modules and teaching tools so that um, basically we can try to explain complex immunological concepts in an easier to understand way. And I focused on designing basic and clinical immunology courses for our second year medical students. On top of that, I tried to design different boards reviews. So if they don't pass their boards, they're not going to get into, you know, they're not going to be able to move along uh, the medical school training. And I created lots of um, interactive exercises to create a more dynamic learning environment. And lastly, I, I serve as a, a course facilitator, which basically helps students learn medicine through these model patient-based cases. And I'm also a member of the Medical School Admissions Committee, uh, where I interview applicants. And that sort of focuses mostly on my teaching. That completes my teaching. But I also was involved, the other part of my work and job involves research. So I'm going to ask a couple questions. So what is an autoimmune disease? That really is when your immune system, your immune cells fail to recognize your tissue as self and it causes them to attack and destroy the tissue. And there are many autoimmune diseases out there. There are actually over 100 autoimmune diseases. So if you name the tissue, there's probably an autoimmune disease associated with that tissue. And there are about 50 million people in the US that are afflicted with different autoimmune conditions. If you have to compare, is it equally distributed among men and women? In general, mostly women um, have are likely to get autoimmune conditions. However, it depends on the autoimmune disease. So if we're talking about Sjogren's syndrome or SLE, systemic lupus erythematosus, that mostly affects women. But when you talk about uh, sarcoid or ulcerative colitis or diabetes mellitus, it's almost a one-to-one -one distribution. Just briefly to, to talk about the genetics of autoimmune diseases, I just want to stress that it's there's no bad gene or bad environment. It's just a bad interaction between the genes and the environment. Okay, and if you were to name a few uh, outside environmental stimuli that could initiate an autoimmune disease, well, poor eating habits, high salt foods, um, smoking, if any of you smoke, or vaping. Vaping is a very big thing. These these can all initiate an autoimmune condition, uh, sun and radiation, as well as um, bacteria, viruses, or toxins can also be initiators of different autoimmune conditions. So if we have to think about uh, the ideology of an autoimmune disease, we know that there are certain genes that predispose one to an autoimmune condition, sex hormones or chromosomes, external triggers. So all of these are contributing to potentially like starting an autoimmune response, as well as random variables. These are immunological random variables, but there are others. And there are lots of unknown conditions. This is why we're trying to create, the fields are trying to create better, better treatments for patients afflicted with autoimmune diseases. So now I'm gonna focus on, after giving an overview of an auto, autoimmune diseases, we're gonna focus on multiple sclerosis for the remainder of this talk and also another inflammatory disease at the end. So what is multiple sclerosis? 
Well, it's a chronic autoimmune demyelinating condition that affects the central nervous system. And the central nervous system consists of your brain and your spinal cord. Okay, it affects about 2.5 million people worldwide. And almost a million people in the United States are, are affected um, by multiple sclerosis. Women outnumber men. And the average disease onset is about 30 years of age. The highest prevalence is north of the equator, mostly affecting the United States, Canada, England, and, the, uh, and, and around the Orkney Islands as well. Um, and it's a very variable, highly variable disease. So during an attack, patients lose their vision, they're weak, they're numb, they have double vision, dizziness, but there's also an outside uh, uh, part of the attack where they have their fatigued, muscle stiffness, weakness, tremor. They have what's called an invisible disease. So you really can't see this disease happening, um, but yet they have all of these clinical outcomes that affect them and that, that hurt, hurt them on a daily basis. Eventually, some, some patients with multiple sclerosis will become paralyzed. So I'm gonna focus on the role of B cells in multiple sclerosis. So here's an image. Um, we have the myelin sheath of neurons and, and that's actually the immune cells destroy the myelin sheath. And that's what causes the issues associated with multiple sclerosis. So here's a, a, an image, a video image of a, of a normal white matter. Okay, the green represents the myelin and the red represents axons. And here in the center, this represents, this is the blood brain barrier. So you can see that the myelin surrounds the axons and allows the nerves to transmit signals over long distances. And here we have a transverse section and this is an MRI. And what happens during an, uh, an attack, uh, the immune cells will somehow cross the blood brain barrier and enter uh, the CNS and cause what is known as a plaque and it'll destroy all the, um, all the myelin that it encounters. So there's no longer myelin coating the axons. And if we look at, at the MRI, we'll just see it as a plaque, okay? But over time, it can become an active lesion. And then um, the immune system will eventually, the immune cells will stop attacking the myelin. And this will allow for the Schwann cells to enter. And then there'll be some sort of regeneration occurring over time. And this is called a, a shadow plaque. But you can see that not all the same connections uh, were, will reappear. So, um, so this maybe the patient may have some paralysis as a result of this, of the immune system attacking um, the CNS, and it'll appear as a shadow plaque. So uh, based on a lot of mouse models of disease, uh, researchers think that both T cells and B cells can be implicated in the pathogenesis of multiple sclerosis. And we're gonna focus mostly on, on B cells, but T cells are also involved because T cells provide help to the B cells and allow the B cells in their in more immature state to become plasma cells and secrete antibodies that will attack different pathogens. But in the case of multiple sclerosis, the antigen is actually myelin. So the B cells are producing myelin uh, restricted uh, antibodies that will attach to myelin whenever they encounter it and activate the immune system. So where do B cells in multiple sclerosis first encounter the myelin? Well, we have two choices. It could happen in the CNS or it can happen in the periphery. So the old hypothesis, if we have two different clones, so say we have B cell clone A and B cell clone B, these are living in the lymph nodes. They'll migrate to the central nervous system and cross the blood brain barrier as we saw previously. And when they encounter myelin, they'll proliferate and then cause damage, okay? but the hypothesis has not been tested. So what can we use to determine where the B cells are proliferating? So we can actually use mutations in the B cell receptors to track the B cells. So here we have an original clone, a B cell clone that has no mutations if we look at the antibody gene. But as that B cell proliferates, it'll acquire one mutation in every next generation. 
and so forth during the third generation, fourth and fifth, it's almost like a birth certificate. So we can track the B cells based on the mutations in their B cell receptor gene. Okay. And then, so we use this, this knowledge to answer several questions. So we originally got um, brain samples and lymph nodes match tissue from the same donors. As, and what we did is we sequenced them and then we looked at the B cell receptors, the mutations in the B cell receptors, and then we organized and formed uh, assembled B cell trees. And in this case, we're just looking at four patients. And these are all patients that had N multiple sclerosis, and they died from complications associated with multiple sclerosis. And we sequenced their lymph nodes, the B cells, the B cell clones in their lymph nodes, and we found multiple. 63,000 over 63,000 in patient M2 and 38,000 over 30,000 in patient M4. And then we also sequenced um, the, these B cell clones in their brain tissue and very small pieces of brain tissue we were able to acquire and find unique sequences, 1,042 in patient M2. So we found uh, a certain number of sequences, but then the next question that we wanted to address was, are these sequences overlapping? Are there any shared sequences? Are there some mature sequences that are occurring in, in, in the different uh, locations? And we found a lot of overlapping sequences to our surprise. So this sort of went against the original hypothesis. And we found out that there were overlapping sequences in the brain and in the periphery in the lymph nodes. So we assembled a new hypothesis where the clones in the lymph nodes would expand in response to an unknown antigen, this could be viral, bacterial, or, or some other unknown antigen. And then they would migrate to the uh, CNS, encounter more, and encounter myelin antigens, and then proliferate again, and then come back into the lymph nodes. So with this knowledge, this new finding, we can actually maybe use drugs that we no longer need to penetrate the blood-brain barrier we can create new strategies that could target specific B cell populations. And it's also possible to monitor the progression of MS by looking for these B cell populations. And lastly, in my lab, we, we also applied new approaches that could be used uh, in MS for other, other diseases. And my lab's focused on looking at a disease called interstitial cystitis bladder pain syndrome, or ICBPS. And this affects about 1% of the US, mostly affecting women. And patients with ICPPS have, they have low capacity, uh, like they can't hold large volumes of urine in their bladder. And they have terrible pain and a small population have what's called a Hunter's lesion, which is here on the right. And think about it, they have all of these lesions in their bladder. And when their bladder fills up, it's very painful. So, um, so it causes extreme pain and discomfort. And it's that currently there's no treatment for this condition. So what my lab is doing is that we're taking bladder biopsies during surgery and we're, we're sequencing um, and looking at the different immune cell populations that may be contributing to the pathogenesis of ICBPS. And we currently presented this work at the American Neurological Association. Um, so I just want to leave you with a few final thoughts before I leave. So we have new sequencing approaches, approaches that are opening up new ways to understand these complex diseases. My career also involved teaching and research, which complemented each other, um, which is quite less common than, than really focusing on just teaching or research tracks. And the last message that I just want to leave you with is that as technologies improve, we'll be able to isolate and implicate maybe a few cells that contribute to autoimmune diseases, disease processes, and maybe we can design better, more targeted therapies with less side effects. I just want to thank, it always takes a, a team of, of multiple researchers to, to, that, that contributed to all aspects of my research, and I couldn't have done it without all of their help. And I would spend a long time mentioning everyone, but I just created this slide just to acknowledge everyone's help. And I wanted to leave you with some art. So this was Elizabeth Jamison. And she has multiple sclerosis, and she, these are her, her images that she actually creates art from, and, and they're very powerful images. Um, thank you for your time, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have.